um, some applications of Spirit just to show you some good practices how to use that library and just open up your eyes uh, what it what you can do actually when you have a good design and this sub quote here programs uh, equals algorithms plus data structures which is a quote from Niklas Wirt who in the 70s invented Pascal and he wrote a book with that with that title and that sub subtitle kind of expresses what we want to show you that you need good data structures you need good algorithms and when you put these two things together you usually get a very nicely maintainable and powerful and functional program okay Okay. This one doesn't work. It's loading. Uh, it's loading. Yeah, there is a cursor. Spinning. Cool. There you go. Here we go. Works. Okay. Uh, how many of you actually know what Spirit is? How many of you have been using Spirit? <laughs> That's lesser. Okay. Um, even if you have been using Spirit, I hope uh, it's not too boring for you if we start off the session. It's recording, thank you. Come in, come in. I'll be in there. Okay. Um, I, I hope you don't mind if we start with around, I think, 45, 50 minutes introduction about some things. What is Spirit? Um, how it's built off? What can you do with Spirit? And afterwards, we want to switch to Scheme. Scheme is a language which, ha which has initially nothing to do with C++ per se. It's a Lisp like language, so it's one of those languages with the tons of parentheses, if you remember that one. And um, we just realized while preparing that talk that Scheme, and we're probably not the first one to realize that, that Scheme is a very, very powerful language allowing you to do very nice things with uh, quite mm, with little effort, I, I'd say. And what we want to do, we want to build a framework to allow it to do uh, rapid development with Spirit, or more concrete with Spirit grammars, with uh, parser grammars. Um, we know that writing parsers with key or with Spirit is uh, quite difficult, um, and so we decided, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we had a uh, framework where you can just interpret your key grammar? Quickly, you know, hack a key grammar and then press a button and it will tell you what, what comes out of it in a very interactive way. And that's what we want to implement or to, to we built a basis for such a framework uh, using Scheme. What Spirit? Many of you already know Spirit is object oriented. It's a recursive decent parser and it's a recursive decent output generation library. It's quite a mouthful, right? Uh, it's object oriented, it's doing parsing, it's doing output generation. Um, and I hope to convince you that it's not difficult to use and that even if you never dealt with parsers or with complex output operations, you can use Spirit in quite some, without having to invest a lot of time in there. <coughs> Spirit is implemented using template metaprogramming techniques, and that's the main reason for why it's so fast in the end. Uh, we have some numbers uh, on the web page, I don't know if everybody saw that, just showing that just parsing an integer or generating an output from an integer with Spirit is up to 10 times faster than everything else available um, in any other library. Spirit is essentially a format-driven input-output library. And um, I want to, <coughs> to emphasize that um, I'm not saying it's a parser library, it's an output generator library. I want to emphasize it's an input library, it's an output library. So it's something you can use to interpret the input, 
which might be strings or binary data. And on the other hand, which you can use to use your inter internal data representation and generate strings from it or binary data. <coughs> um, the trick here is, or the, the interesting thing is that the grammars which specify the input format or the output format are written entirely in C++. So you don't need any separate tools to compile your grammars. It integrates seamlessly with other C++ code. It's immediately executable. You can integrate your data structures in there seamlessly and so on. And last but not least, it provides you with three domain-specific embedded languages. It's essentially a way of expressing the grammars for the input and for the output in, in directly in C++. Um, and the third one, we, we won't touch on that today, is a Lexa library which allows to do more complex parsing tasks. I'll just mention it for the, for the sake of completeness. Okay, where can you get that stuff? The current version of Spirit is version 2.3, which has been released with the latest boost version last week. Uh, the code for this session is available completely from the SVN. And you need to have or to look at the SVN because the code is not contained in the last week's release. Uh, it will be available with uh, the next version of Spirit or with the next boost version. If you think about your usual program, you get some input, you convert that input into some internal data representation, you do something to that input, to your internal data, and then you convert that input, internal data back to some output res representation. Mm, and if you think about that to be the normal text processing transformation or binary data transformation, you see that key and karma which are two sub-libraries of Spirit, uh, cover the input part and the output part of that whole text transformation uh, chain. You have the input, you parse that input based on some grammar specification on the format description, what you want to read in. You create some parse tree, which can be as simple as a simple integer or some complex internal um, abstract syntax tree. Come on, guys. Come in. Uh, then the transformation part itself is not covered by, by Spirit. And on the other hand, after you transform your, inter uh, your internal data representation, you get, uh, again, some different internal data representation and you use some format specification to generate the output from it. A quick overview about Spirit as, as a library. Um, just to mention it again for the sake of completeness, Spirit consists out of four parts. Key for parsing, comma for, for the output generation. And the other two parts, we call it classic. That's the old version of Spirit, uh, which we released for years uh, under version one point something. We keep it there for backward compatibility, mainly that Robert can compile his serialization library without any problems. Um, and there's a lot of code written in, in, in that Spirit version, that's why we keep it there. And as I already mentioned, <coughs> the Lexa, but we won't touch on that today. Yeah, that's very much what I already mentioned. <coughs> let's see if I forgot something. No, let's, let's skip that. Two years ago or three years ago, somebody came up with the term yin and yen because three years ago everybody knew Spirit as a parser library and we came up with the idea to complement that parsing part with the output generation part. So I think Eric was it, right? Eric's just, or Dave, they just said, hey, we have yin is key and the yang of that, the opposite side, is the output generation. And that's very true because when you think about input and output, um, it's just two sides of the same metal and you find very, very much, or very, almost everything is very similar. You just have to look from the different perspective on to it. Um, yeah, parsing expression grammars. Um, 
earlier sp spirit implementations uh, were based on EBNF, that's the extended Becker's now format. It's just some formalization how you can specify it format for parsers. Um, parsing expression grammars is just another way to write those grammars. So it's in the end a formal grammar for describing formal languages. But I don't want to bore you with this uh, quite um, formal stuff. The, the essence is that you have a specification of, of your data format you want to interpret or you want to generate, which is very much like BNF plus regular expressions. So think about it like BNF on steroids or so. We will see some details how that works. Um, the benefit of using parsing expression grammars is that they are non-ambiguous. That's very important. And each parsing expression grammar can be directly represented as a recursive decent parser, and that's what we are doing in, in Key. So the transformation of a given parsing exp uh, expression grammar into the corresponding parser is very easy and it's a formal process. And that's the reason why we can do that with, with the help of, of templates and with the help of the C++ compiler. Okay, so let's start with parsing input. Key uh, is the part which, is, which, which deals with uh, parsers, so it deals with input. And it's a library allowing to flexibly parse input based on a given parsing expression grammar. So it's a parser generator in the common sense, like you know Yak or Bison or those kind of tools. But the difference is that it's built into C++ and you don't have to use an external tool to do the same thing. Currently, uh, we generate recursive decent parsers, as I already mentioned, which perfectly map onto uh, parsing expression grammars. Uh, how many of you know what it recursive decent parser is. Oh, okay, it's an overwhelming majority. So I'm, I'm not going to discuss that in detail. Uh, let me say only that recursive decent parser is a top-down parser. So you start from the, from the top and start matching your input, which is built from a set of mutually recursive functions. So for each input data item, you have a function. So when you want to parse an int, you have a function which parses an int. And when you parse a character, you have a function which parses a character. And what you're doing by saying, I want to parse an int followed by a character, you just call first the function which parses the int, and then you call the function which parses a character. And just by combining these simple elementary functions com corresponding to the input format, you create more complex format out of it in a very straightforward manner. And that's what Spirit is doing. Um, key defines a domain-specific language, which is hosted directly in C++, that's mentioned as well. And the trick here is that we are using operator overloading and expression templates and some template metaprogramming tricks to convert the C++ expression, which is uh, a normal C++ expression with plus and minus and shift operator and so on, into the corresponding parser, which is described by this um, expression. Let's make an example. Let's take the infix calculator grammar, which is uh, fairly easy to understand. Um, and that's the notation in parsing expression grammars. It's not really C++ code. And it says, OK, I have an expression. And an expression is a term followed by a plus and a term, or a term followed by a minus and a term. And a term is a factor followed by a star and a factor or followed by a slash and a factor. And a factor in the end is either an integer or it's an expression, so it's recursive, it's an expression embedded in parentheses. Uh, okay, it's a very simple calculator, right? Or at least a grammar which is able to, um, to match any plus minus these four uh, elementary operations. Um, and what we did in Spirit, we just thought, hey, that perfectly maps on C++. The only thing what we did there is, since PEG, the parsing expression grammars, use pure juxtaposition of, of things, which is not possible, Bjarne didn't get his proposals through to overload the white space. I don't know if you, everybody <laughs> read that. So. <laughs> 
white space? It's a white space? <laughs> You'll have to Google that. That, that wasn't Bjarne's uh, April Fool's joke where he proposed to overload white space for, for different things. So it's really cool. So, and since we don't have that yet in C++, we had just to insert some placeholder operator we could use to express juxtaposition. Let me go back so the PG doesn't have that and Spirit has that. The second change we had to, made, mm, to make, and that's mainly because of precedence rules, is we had to change the slash for the normal OR operator. And the third main change we did is we moved the postfix star in the PG to be a prefix star in C++. Let me go back so you see that. Okay. I think it's more or less clear. So this expression is pure C++. And every C++ compiler will happily understand that if the operators are properly defined. And to make that work, we need some scaffolding. And that scaffolding is, OK, we say we define a rule which works on input iterators from a string in this case. And then we define our so-called non-terminals, a factor, a term, and an expression, and assign an expression on the right-hand side. And the only thing which is we didn't talk about yet is that int underscore. Um, Spirit defines a whole bunch of elementary parsers for integers, for doubles, for strings, for whatnot, allowing to parse these elementary built-in data types. And we just decided to use the name of the built-in data type and append an underscore there. So it's easy to, to know what parser do I need to parse an integer, what parser do I need to parse in short or long or, or whatnot. So could I, could I actually add, um, say, a complex uh, type, or my own user type? Uh, sure. We will see how to do that, and that's part of what, what we want to show you, how to integrate your data types with the existing algorithms to get something completely new of that. That's why program is algorithm plus data types. So um, essentially what, what Spirit is doing, it uses opera, operator overloading to convince a compiler to use that expression and not interpret it verb, mm, uh, as, as it's written, but to interpret it as a parser expression and to generate a recursive decent parsers which when fed with a proper input string will say hey yeah that's a, that matches this grammar or it doesn't match that grammar and you can do additional stuff there. Make sense? Everybody still with me? Okay that's the input part. Output. We call it the library karma I don't even know why. It was just a ni nice name, right? And afterwards we came up. Uh, I have that on some slide. Reaction. It's a reaction, yeah. And after we had that name for output, we just thought, hey, no, we can't leave that parser library without a name. And we Googled around and said, OK, key sounds nice, so let's call the parser library key. So Karma is a library allowing to flexibly generate arbitrary character or byte sequences. So. It's based on the idea that when you have a grammar which ca you can use to parse an input sequence, you may as well use the same grammar to generate that sequence, right? If you know that you expect an integer followed by a double, then you can use the same format description to generate an integer followed by a double. So it's very symmetric, right? Um, for parsing needs, um, most programmers use handwritten code or parser generator tools. And unfortunately, there isn't anything like that, like a unparser generator. Uh, even if unparser is a common term, which I try to avoid but, but because it's kind of ambiguous. But there aren't any tools for C++ where you can say, hey, I have that output description and I want to generate something from it. So it generates actually the output as I wanted to have formatted. And we had that discussion with, with Jeff um, in, in the library of the week. Part of the I.O. problem or part of the std stream library is that formatting is just screwed up. Right? <coughs> it's almost impossible to use. So we thought Karma is such a tool. It's inspired by the string template library, which is part of the well-known Antler parser generator library. 
um, and it allows strict model view separation. So you can separate your data from your format. Same as in a parser, right? You specify your format and you specify your data where, where you want to get the results in. It's the same you can do in Karma where you have that strict separation and you don't have that strict separation in st stream. And that's uh, one of the reasons why it's so awkward to use because everything is mixed together. Try to change a format there if you have a complex output operation. You just go, go nuts. <laughs> um, so again, as you can see from the structure of the slides, it's almost the same text as on a key page, right? It defines a domain-specific embedded language allowing to specify the structure of the output to generate in this case in a language derived from PG. And it turns out if you turn around PG a bit, you can use the parsing expression grammars to specify output expression grammars. We call those guys inverse parsing expression grammars just to keep the notion. Let's do an example here as well. <clears throat> Let's assume you passed in your input arithmetic expression and you created an um, abstract syntax tree, a data structure which contains information about the passed input. By the way, Joao, could, could you open the door there just to, so we get some fresh air, if you don't mind? Yeah? Well, it should be openable. Open the top. Just open it a bit. I mean, I think otherwise we will just suffocate here. The other years it was openable, so we could open it. Doesn't work? Okay, so we have, we have to suffer. I'm sorry. Okay, let's assume we have a, a abstract syntax tree, just a data structure which expresses the expression in a tree structure in the memory. And let's call that thing AST node. And we know that our AST node could either be an integer, a binary expression, or a unary expression, right? That's all what we have in, 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 in your math mathematic uh, operation there. On the other hand, a binary node is a AST node combined with a different AST node and some binary code, where the binary code is either one of the mathematic operations. Um, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm writing a reverse Polish notation expression generator. If I wanted to write a infix op, um, expression format, I just would move the binary expression in between the, the, the ASTs and I would get the normal mathematic expression. A unary node is, okay, these parentheses we put there just for brevity and to avoid ambiguities, a AST node followed by some unary operation where the unary operation is either a plus or a minus. And we can do the same thing in, in karma as we did in, in key. We just define some scaffolding and then we apply the same rules we applied for transformation of parsing expression grammars to a key grammar from the inverse parsing expression grammar to a comma grammar. So we know that an AST node is either an integer or a binary node or a unary node and the AST, a binary node is an AST node followed by an AST node followed by the code and so on and so on. As you can see we just try to keep a bit of C++ tradition here. Std streams um, use left shift for input or output and right shift for, for input and we just kept that. So if in key we use a right shift operator to, note, to f um, express sequences, we use a left shift operator in, in Karma. But that's not a principal um, difference. So far, every, everybody good? Robert. I have one, just to make sure I understand this. So in order to have a symmetric setup where I can use the say, you know, I can put something out and then bring it back in, I, I really have to define the two. I can't use the same grammar for both. I have to do uh, the uh, The answer is yes and no. The yes part is the experience shows that you often want to have different grammars for input and output because input grammars are written based on the input data description 
whereas output grammars mostly are written based on the internal data representation you have and not of the format you want to get. And I, I will come to that and you will see it in the end. It's a lot easier if you think about output in terms of internal data representation to convert to something, then you think of, hey, I want to that format. How can I squeeze my data into that format? And the yes, uh, the no part, is it yes part, no part, the other part, is <laughs> we, in the beginning, in the very beginning, we had the idea to do exactly that, to have the same format, for instance, for network protocols, right? On one end you use that, and on the other end you, you use the same thing just to de deserialize it again. And we had the ampersand as in serialization there to be used in both libraries. But we dropped that because we realized you very, very seldom need, really need the same format there. But it's not a problem to add the ampersand if you want that, to have the same, same uh, grammar to be used in different libraries. Answer the question, okay. Just um, contrasting key and comma, I understand when a parse fails, because your input mm -hmm. doesn't match, what happens when a karma data structure doesn't parse? Then the generator fails. If and how does it tell you why it failed or where? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, that's some... Key has error handlers, which can just, uh, it's an exception which is thrown and you can handle. Karma doesn't have that yet, but I came to the conclusion, especially wh while preparing for that talk, we, we will need that there as well, and we probably will add error handling to Karma as well, so you can throw internally an exception if something goes wrong. Currently, the generator just fails and you can select a different alternative or so. But we will get to that. Okay, let's look at that table and, and compare parsing expression grammars with how it's uh, expressed in, in, in spirit. The plain sequence in parsing expression grammars just expressed using juxtaposition is expressed using right shift or left shift operator. The alternative, we have just the or. Um, clean, that means zero or more, like in regular expressions, right? In PG, it's the postfix star. Since we don't have a postfix operator, we just move that in, in front of, of, the, of the expression. One or more is the same as a regular expression. Again, we again moved it to be in front. The end predicate and the not predicate, uh, we will see what these guys are doing. We can express equally well in, in C++ without any problems. And the optional, well, here we don't have any choice than to introduce a completely different operator. And we just said, okay, let's take the minus instead of the postfix question, question mark. That's the only place where you really have to know that something is different from the, from the PG. Um. Herman, did you lose any um, um, express expressibility by moving from a right recursive grammar to a left recursive grammar? No. Uh, recursive, um, recursive decent parsers are notoriously bad at left recursive grammars. They just will go into infinite well, that's, recursion. That's why I say, but you, but you have left recursive. <coughs> no, that's not left recursive. That's a clean operation. That's something different. Okay, okay. So it just repeats that thing zero to to arbitrary yeah. number of times. And by the way, that's a not very nice way to resolve left recursive grammars just by convert them to use a clean and and so you, there. Okay. Very easy ways to convert any left recursive grammar to something you can use with key. Okay. That's nice, but we didn't stop there. We said, hey, we are on a, on a run. Let's define a couple of operators more, which are not in parsing expression grammars, because these are really powerful. That's a sequential OR. It's a non-shortcutting OR, which is in key only, which means please match A or B or A followed by B. So it's a, a nice shortcut in the end. That's my favorite one, lists. So match A's separated by B's, comma separated lists, for instance, or things like that. Permutation, match A or B in any sequence, either first in A or first in B, or you can concatenate that and you can say I have A, B, C, D, E, and I want to match them in any sequence. Um, expect, that's for error handling, you, you mentioned that. It has essentially the same meaning as a sequence operator that I want to match A followed by B, but it has the additional meaning that 
I want to match A followed by B, but if after A I don't see a B, I throw an exception, which can be caught on, on higher level parsing, so you, I can handle that input error. Character set negation, which works for characters only, is a tilde, so I want to match anything but a single character or a character set. And this one is very interesting and very powerful and we will see it quite a lot today. <coughs> we call them semantic actions. That means that if I have a parser A or an expression A, let, let's talk about parsers. If I have a parser A and I match that A, I will call the function f. So f is an arbitrary function object I can put in there, which gets called whenever I match that. So you can nicely interface your code with a parser. And you can invoke actions whenever something in the input happened. And as it turns out, that is very powerful for output generation as well, but we, we will see the details there. Okay. <coughs> um, currently everything is a recursive descent implementation. It's not only descent, or is it descent, or descent? Or descent. I'm sorry. I'm, so it, I mean descent whenever I say decent. Yeah. So that's. A, I mean it's decent, but uh, okay. <laughs> Other schemes are uh, possible there, but we didn't implement them yet. Uh, that stuff is almost the same I already sa said in one way or another, but let me repeat that. Spirit makes a compiler generate format-driven parsers or generators um, for you. So you specify a format and the compiler generates a parser or the output generation for you. The C++ expression is, uh, and since we use Proto, Boost Proto as an underlying mechanism to implement that, essentially each C++ expression gets converted into a Proto type, a type in Boost Proto, which is a complex type encoding the C++ expression. So it's essentially your expression tree as a type. And that's achieved by tainting at least one of the elements of your expression uh, with a Proto placeholder. We will see that, uh, how that's needed uh, and why is that needed. And then this expression tree, this proto expression tree, is converted to the corresponding parser or generator. The first step, the generation of that proto expression is done at compile time. And then at runtime, whenever the parser gets created or the, the generator gets created, code is invoked which converts that proto expression into the, co the corresponding parser expression. The last point on this slide, and that's the most important point I want to tell you about today. And if you go away and you just remember parsers and generators are fully attributed, I did my job well. Because that's the absolute crucial point of understanding spirit. And uh, when we uh, talk about, or when, when we see what requests we get, what, what questions we get, Michael can, can sing a, a song from that, you know, every day in, in IRC he gets this question, hey, why does my parser doesn't work and why everybody has problems with key? But the reason is that they don't understand how this attribution and this, this fully attribution of, of these parsers work. And I really hope to convey today the idea how you can utilize this mechanism in your own code, which is very, very powerful. So that means uh, parsers and generators are fully attributed. That means that each of the components you use in, in your format description provides for parsers or expects for generators a value of a specific type. When you parse an integer, it provides you with an integer. When you parse a double, it provides you with a double. When you want to output a string, you use a string for that, right? So, and so on. So each component has a specific type which is defined by the component itself. Uh, certainly the usual compatibility rules or convertibility rules of C++ apply. So when you have a C++ uh, a integer parser, you can assign the result to a long or you can assign to the result to a short without the compiler complaining. Perhaps you get a warning because of truncation, but otherwise the same rules apply there. Um, this table is a list of attributes different parser types expose. 
These ones are fairly straightforward, I think. A int parser gives you an int, a character parser gives you a character, a double parser gives you a double, and so on. Um, more interesting are the operators. What type do I get from a clean parser when I parse a list of integers, for instance? Naturally, why not get a standard container out of that? You know, when I parse a list of integers, I want to have that in a, in a certain data structure I can handle. So I, I just say, okay, by default it gives you a standard vector of ints. <coughs> Same for... Um, yeah. By default it gives standard vector, but if I have my own vector... No, you will see that you just can use it. Um, there are two things, and we, I will get back to that again and again. A parser, for instance, exposes a intrinsic type for instance, a clean of integers exposes a vector of integers. That's one thing. But on the other hand, you can pass from the outside any compatible type to the parser and it will fill it. So if I pass a list of integers, a std list, it will fill that std list because it's generically compatible. You know, both have a push pushback and both have a size operator and, and, and the compiler doesn't complain if I just use a compatible data structure. There. So, so like, like template. So uh, it yeah. has to have a pushback and a size. Right. And if it doesn't, you still have possibility to uh, integrate your own data structures. Um, we, will, we won't touch that today or perhaps a bit. Um, we have customization points, which is essentially templates Spirit uses to integrate a given data type. And when you provide a specialization of that template, you can just specialize for your data type and overload the pushback which is needed by Spirit and convert it to some other call. So it's just partial template specialization going on there. I think Michael was touching that Question? Bit, right? Oh, yes. But I, I think I'll... Yeah. Any questions? By the plus operator is uh, obviously the same. The optional is more interesting, right? If I expect an integer or no integer there, what will I use? Certainly, I just use a boost optional there as a, as a attribute this parser exposes. So that when I parse an input with this format description and I parse an optional to be filled, I can afterwards detect, hey, did I get my integer or didn't, right? Uh, the list is again a standard vector. We just drop the attribute of B. We just l collect the A's because when you have a comma separated list, you're not interested in the comma. You're interested in the things in between commas. Sequence, that's a tricky one. How many of you know fusion? Uh, fusion is a library which gives you generic tuples. Everybody knows what a tuple is? Yeah. It's a data structure where you can just combine arbitrary data types in one container. So you have a tuple of an integer and a double of an integer. So you have essentially a struct which contains these types. And the natural match for sequences are tuples, right? When I want to match an integer followed by a double, followed by an integer, the natural match for that sequence is to have a tuple to be filled by an integer, by a double, and by the integer. Right, so it's fairly fairly straightforward. And again, uh, by default, it exposes a fusion vector, but you can pass any fusion sequence. Like boost tuple. Boost tuple if you fusionify it. So you have to include the proper header file. Then it will be a fusion sequence, and you can can so do it. Why why fusion vector? Why not boost tuple? Because what? fusion is much more powerful than than, okay. than, and we are relying on on a lot more facilities of fusion internally than the, the, the ability to store it as a tuple. We rely on all the or many algorithms implemented in Fusion, and these work on Fusion sequences anyway, so we just expose a few. Uh, even algorithms 
Hmm. This couple doesn't have algorithms. Okay. We need the algorithms yeah. to work on heterogeneous sequences. And even more, you can convert almost any data structure into or make a view which which converts any data structure into a fusion sequence. So there are a lot of utilities in, in fusion which allow to do that. You can take like a structure and right. 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 struct if you, if you want. Okay. We have struct adapters. Struct or std pair or boost array or all these things are, can be converted into fusion segments. Okay. So think about the attribute for a sequence as a tuple. That's the easiest way to understand that. Alternatives, if I want to pass an A or an B, the natural solution is used, boost variant, right? I have a variant of which is either contains A when I match an A, or it will contain the B when I match the B. Predicates have no attribute, and the permutation is a bit more complex as a vector of optionals because I don't know which of those I find and I don't know in which sequence I find them so I just have to store them in a way so I can figure out afterwards which one uh, I found. Yes, Dave? In the previous slide you had an alternative operator that accepted A, B or both. Uh, what kind of uh, attribute would that? Good question. I don't remember. It was a fusion sequence somehow. I have to look it up. I, I'll get back to you on that. Uh, um, like the permutation. I think it's a very, very similar to that. Okay. Options. I I have to get back to you on that. I just run, don't remember. Not like you know, it, when I'm when I'm going to use Spirit to stream in something into yeah. my application. Yeah. So my application data structure is not going to. I mean, I will have a std vector, yeah. but like you know, it will have its own structures yeah. and everything, right? Yeah. So I will be able to stream directly yeah. into yeah. that yeah. rather than this temporary yeah. value yeah. copy. What I am showing here are the default attributes exposed by parser, and I'm really making a point out of that. Even if I bore you, I'm, I'm really sorry if, if that happens, because that's absolutely crucial to understand what Spirit is about and how Spirit works. If you don't understand how these parser uh, how these attribute propagation rules work, you will have a hard time to understand later on how, why this code, which just seems to be magic, why it, it really works. And so that's why I, I really uh, try to, to make a point here. Okay, the semantic action, it just exposes the attribute of, of the parser A, because the function F doesn't matter there. The function F gets the attribute passed as well, but the overall expression exposes A. Um, same thing for karma. Same table, almost the same thing, except for this one, which points in the other direction. When you want to output an integer, you certainly give it an integer. When you want to output a car, a formatted character, you give it a character, and so on. When you want to output a list of things, which is standard vector or any, any uh, standard container, you use a clean. And when you want to uh, uh, output an optional, you just use an optional, and so on and so on. So, uh, yes? Uh, I just thought about some more powerful vector type, like a non-empty vector type. So yeah. If you, if you pass a plus A, you know you will pass Yeah, it will fail if the vector is empty. Yeah, but it will fail at runtime in the past. Yes. Yeah, it will fail at runtime. That's a trick here. Plus will fail if the vector is empty. The alternative will fail if the if you pass any type which is not compatible with any of those. And if you pass an A and the or just a pure A without a variant, then the compiler will just get rid of the or B and will generate a generator which consists only out of the A and so on. So it's a mix of runtime and compile time um, things which allow you to generate very efficient generators or parsers in the other time. Okay, I, I'm not going into detail here. You can look that up later on. I'm running already out of time here. So let me speed up a bit. Attribute propagation. We saw each component has its own native intrinsic attribute, but when you start to combine these things, attribute propagation happens. So, okay, these simple types are, are clear, and we already saw that the normal uh, convertibility rules apply. So, when in key, any C++ type may receive the passed value as long as the attribute type of the parser is convertible. So if I parse an int, anything which can be converted, uh, an int can be converted to 
can be used to receive that end. If I give it a double, it will convert that easily. In Karma, the other way around, any C type, C++ type may be consumed by a generator as long as the attribute type is convertible to that output type. When I want to put output an integer, I can pass it a double. It will cut it off and truncate it, but the compiler will happily accept that. <laughs> um, something you will see in Spirit's documentation very often is this way of expressing things, and that's what we call attribute propagation rules, which is just a funny way to say, if I have a parser A, which has an attribute of capital A, and a parser B of, with an attribute of capital B, then the attribute of A followed by B is a tuple of those both types. And yeah, in the documentation you will find that for each parser type, and you will find a whole list of things each parser type or each generator type supports. So compound components implement specific propagation rules. That's what we already saw. But as it turned out, often you want to have more. If you have a comma separated list, like, uh, I don't know, int followed by zero or more commas followed by another int. I'm sorry if you don't see it. Uh, it's really just a comma separated list, right? And you want to have it the same attribute as if you wrote int percent comma, which means the same thing, a comma separated list of integers. So, and, and in order to accommodate that, certain component, compound components have additional rules. So if you have a sequence of A and B, where A and B expose the same attribute, you can still pass it a vector and it will fill that vector instead of the tuple, which it has in the generic case. And that makes it very powerful because you can actually convert sequences of same things into a std container and not into a more or less awkward tuple, which is not always what you want to have. So several of those of the, of the compound um, components have these additional rules. Uh, uh, the last thing, in order for a type to be compatible with the attribute type of a compound expression, it has to be either co be convertible to the attribute type, so any fusion sequence will do, fusion sequence of A and B will do because it's convertible to the exposed attribute, or it has to expose certain functionalities, that's what you asked. It has to have a pushback in order to be used with a clean it has to be a, uh, has to have a, I don't know what, a pair of iterators to be used for output generation when you use a clean, and things like that. Uh, I think Sorry, that's, would yeah. Would you mind if we close the, the door now? It's getting a little bit I don't here. mind. I don't, just don't want you to fall asleep. Okay. <laughs> so if you... Uh, if you yeah. believe that you can manage to stay awake, then I have no problems with <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yes? In the previous, in the previous slide, uh, if I wanted to associate a semantic action for uh, parsing A and B, hmm? I should put the square brackets after A and Yes. Okay. And we will see that you can either access the attribute of A and B separately in that, uh, or you can just access it as a tuple. So you can both do, uh, do both things. We will see examples of that later on. Um, let's compare key and comma quickly. Main components, parser, generator. The main routines are parse and the other ca uh, case a function called generate. The primitives are almost the same. The non-terminals we will see then, I know we saw them in the examples in the beginning, the rule are the same. The operators are the same except for the sequence operator. And you have a couple of sp uh, specific so-called, we call them Directives, uh, directives, directives, what's the problem? I never know that. <laughs> directives? Directives. I'm sorry, I'm not a native speaker, so I have to ask that from time to time just to make sure that you understand what I want to say. So, again, you see it's just the opposite side of the same metal using exactly the same ways to express things. And as it turns out, this is an instance of a type, of a proto-type. And when it's used in Karma, it's an instance of a prototype. And the very same type 
is used here. So that's just the same placeholder which is used in both libraries. And that's the power of Proto, and which allows you to do that. So you don't even have different internal representations of these things. It's really the same thing, just used differently and interpreted differently. <clears throat> now, that's an interesting thing. If you have a semantic action in a parser, it is meant to receive the value which you matched. So when you matched an integer, you certainly want to get that integer inside your function you're attaching. In Karma, it provides, it provides the value to output. So when you want to generate an integer, then you expect the function which is attached as a semantic action to give you that value which has to be output. So it's, again, a symmetric thing. And he, your question, you, you just can attach it here. And underscore one refers to the first one, underscore two refers to the second one. If you need both, use underscore zero. Just a normal placeholder semantics. Um, you see that in this case, underscore one contains the value I matched and I assign it somewhere. And in this case, I have a value which I assign to the underscore one, which is the attribute consumed by the, by the integer. So in the first case, underscore one and underscore zero both will work? No. Uh, underscore, yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure if you wouldn't get a fusion tuple consisting out of one element. one element. I'm not sure, I have to check that. Okay, attributes. Attribute of parser components, it's some kind of return type of a parser, right? So if you parse something, you get, get it back. So it's a type of the value it generates, and it must be convertible to the target type. In Karma, the attribute of a generator component is a type of the value it expects to get, i.e the provided value must be convertible to that type. In parsers, attributes are propagated up from the bottom to the type you want to get out of it. In Karma, you propagate it down. Attributes are parsed and non-const in parsers, obviously, because you want to fill them. In Karma, it's a const, a const references because you just want to reference them and want to output the values from them. Um, and here's one difference, and I, I'm not sure how to resolve that, by the way. Parsers can work in two modes. Either you use a parser just to match an input without getting the value. You just want to know, hey, does it match my expression or doesn't? That works with parsers, nice. But it doesn't work with generators. A generator doesn't make any sense if I don't provide any value to generate, right? So that's one difference of, of these two things. I'm hope I'm almost through. I have still 10 minutes left and I will get through that quickly. Um, I want to give you a couple of more examples of spirit, key and karma just to, to give you a sense of what you can do and how these this very abstract notions, abstract notion I, I gave you is implemented and this is um, actually working in practice. Um, I'll skip that. That's just stuff I was talking about already. Um, let's write a calculator. And a calculator which parses the input and gives you the value it, it, uh, of that mathematic expression it, it found in the input. That's the normal scaffolding uh, you have to, to add. Um, so you define a grammar. You define the iterator of the input. So if your input comes from a string, then you use the string iterator. And this definition here is essentially exactly the code I showed you before. And that's the declaration of the variables involved here. Okay, that's your, our glorious thing we saw in the very beginning, right? Expression is a term followed by a plus and minus term, or uh, the term is a factor, and a factor is, okay, in this case it's an unsigned int, or an expression in parentheses, or the uni unary expressions we knew before. And if you plug that code into the previous slide, instead of that comment, you have your parser which understands mathematic expressions. Nothing more to it. That's it. And just to show you that it works, it's a small example, you, you find it in the spirit code base. 
If you enter 1 plus 2, it says, okay, parsing succeeded. I understand that. And if I enter 2 uh, multiplied by parentheses 2 plus 4 without the closing parentheses, I just get a message with mm, parsing failed, and I stopped at some point where I can't make any sense out of it. And we will see how we can improve this error messages later on. Okay, let's do the calculation. And what we do, we, in the previous version, we <coughs> didn't specify what type the grammar gives us back. And in this version, we just add the, this funny syntax, which essentially says, I'm defining a parser which has an integer as its return type. And that's why we chose the function declaration syntax here, which is very similar to the boost function or other libraries. And, and don't uh, mix that up or um, don't think that it's a real function declaration. It's just an upuse of the function declaration syntaxes, allowing us to deduce a return type of that rule or of that grammar we want to use. And we will see that we need that parameter in there later on as well. Yes? Um, just a question, why can't you pass on the int on the uh, in parser theory, you have a so-called synthesized attribute, which is a thing which you get back from the parser. And you have so-called inherited attributes. That's something you pass downstream into the parser as parameters. And that's exactly what you can do here as well. So you could specify additional types inside the, the, the parentheses, just telling that this parser actually needs additional parameters to work. And we will see examples later on how, how to use that. So think as a parser, as a function. A function which takes input parameters, does some magic, and returns your value. And that's why we use this syntax, just to express that notion. A parser is something which gives you a value back. OK, we add that here. Yes? Yeah, um, I noticed that you uh, had an uh, unsigned end. And you were passing into this? And oh, you okay. You, 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 you caught me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just want, um, I just want to make sure that it's uh, not, to be an uh, no, no, you, didn't, oh, you yeah. didn't catch me. The, problem, the point is that we have an unsigned int which might be preceded with a minus sign, which might be a unary expression. So in the end, I get an integer out of that. Otherwise, I lose the, the yeah. Z sign. That makes sense. Okay. And we use the same grammar but we attach a couple of semantic actions to them. So whenever I see a term followed by a plus in a term, or whenever I see a term, I initialize the value of my expression to be the value of whatever I matched. So underscore val stands for the attribute of the left-hand side, and underscore one stands for the thing it's attached to. And when this term is followed by a plus in a term, I just add whatever I matched here to the value which I initialized previously in there. Yeah, obvious. You see what I mean? So underscore val is a placeholder which refers to the value, or which refers to the attribute of the left-hand side of my uh, non-terminal. Whereas underscore one, two, three, four, refer to the attributes of the parsers this thing is attached to. Make sense? And if I do that for everybody, what I get is a calculator. And it actually not only matches the input, but it uses the values it, it matched and calculates the result. Yes? So, uh, by the way, this is the first time I've seen this. Huh? Eyes. And when, when I first, uh, first imagined what the semantic action would look like, I kind of... A certain to have an exp a certain prototype, uh -huh. just so Spirit can call them. And uh, lambdas, if you want to use lambdas, you have to, to use a full prototype to define your lambda, which uh, most of the information, most of the parameters you never use, which is a bit of inconvenient. And uh, for implementing a full lambda support, Who's sleeping? Nevin. Fuck. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry. 
<laughs> and uh, to, to support full lambdas, so you can shorten the, the um, uh, and Spirit, with normal function object, Spirit supports shortening the attribute list, uh, the, the parameter list internally, so you don't have to specify each and everything. But you need extended Sfine for that. Uh, uh, variadic templates and R value references. So that's, that's, and essentially only GCC supports that yet, so we didn't implement it. Yeah? Uh, so basically, whatever is in the square brackets is basically a functional object. Yes, right. So and and that's, think about that as a lambda expression in there. So, are, how limited are you in what you can express in there? Uh, what we you can put anything in there. You can put a global function in there, which is completely independent of any function object. So you can put a global function there. You can put any function object there, be it lambda, bind, whatnot. But what we suggest and what we uh, usually use are Phoenix. I don't know who knows Phoenix. Phoenix is another library of Boost, which is written for um, express functional paradigms in, in, in C++. And these guys here are essentially, con or this whole expression is a Phoenix expression, which is evaluated by, by Phoenix. So you can build whatever Phoenix can, can do for you. Underscore value is equal to two uh, of underscore one. So if you could uh, say val underscore val equals well, it's a placeholder, yeah. which stands for the attribute of the left-hand side. So whenever you assign something to well, actually you assign something to the attribute. Okay. Right. So when you, if you were to say well equals foo of underscore one. Uh, if foo is a lazy function, that works. Function. No, that doesn't work. That's my question. Because these things are not immediately executed, but only executed at parse time. So when you define them and the compiler sees them, it's not a function invocation you insert here, but you just say, hey, whenever in your parsing process you get to that unsigned in in uh, integer, call that function. So we call it, it's a lazy function. You know, it's a prebound function, and you can do that with, with Phoenix fine. So if you define a, a func Phoenix function foo, then can you certainly can do that. Okay, what we get? Two times three is six, works. More complex expressions, 197 works as well. So it seems like magic, but the trick is that you have to know how the attributes are flowing underneath in, in the parser, and, and you then you can build arbitrary complex things with it. Yeah, a, a word about semantic actions. We already uh, touched on that. Uh, one and two refer to the elements of the thing it's attached to. Well refers to the left-hand side. The placeholder pass is a special placeholder you can use to make a pass fail in retrospective. So if you assign false to it, then the whole pass will fail. Uh, R1 and N2 and B, uh, I won't touch on that. We will see examples later. Okay, now build a let's build a compiler. Let's build Clang. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Let's assume we have a virtual machine which understands opcodes, and our opcodes are add, sub, multiply, divide, <coughs> integer, uh, negate, and stuff like that. And push back, let's assume that's a lazy function, as you asked, which just pushes a certain code onto the, where does this code from? The other way around. The other way around, yeah. Yeah, code is a, is a, is a vector, and that's the opcode I want to push into that vector. So if I interpret that expression, whenever I see a term, um, term, 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 an unsigned integer, I push back the integer onto the stack and the value of that integer. Then I see a plus and another term. Okay, I say I have an integer on a stack and I say push a add to it so it will add the two numbers. Right? We got the second number, and then we put the add on it, and so, uh, so on and so on. So whenever you parse that and execute that code, what you get in the output is a vector which is filled with the operations you have to execute to run your, your expression. A compiler, right? Nothing else. And I come to that. When you run that, it actually works. Uh, sometimes, here. Um, no. And the other thing I wanted to highlight here is the... 
it's the usage of the expectation points, which is our error handling mechanism, where you say, okay, when I saw a term followed by a plus, then I have to see a term, otherwise I have an error. And if I saw a factor followed by a star, I have to see a vector, otherwise I will get an error. And what this allows to do is to automatically generate much better error messages from my parsing. Remember in the first example we, we just pointed somewhere, you know, not at the point of the error. But in this case, if we just put a, a wrong parenthesis here, it says, hey, I actually expect a parenthesis here at this point where you specified a bracket. And all this automatically works just because of these expectation points, we, because we can track the error mechanism or the, the, the grammar much better and match it to, to the input. How do, you, how do you identify the places in the grammar the, the exception was grammar? Very good question. Uh, that requires some additional code, which is not on that slide. Essentially what you're doing, you say, hey, uh, Whenever an error happens in term, please call that function. And whenever an error happens in factor, please call that function. And that's an additional function call. You have to say on error, first parameter term, uh, second parameter the function you want to call, and then it will get invoked. But we will have examples for that as well. So I'm getting late, you know that. Okay. okay. How, how does he know that the second part is missing? Is there a rule there? There are two with expression in the middle. How does he know that there's a factor rule doesn't work? He doesn't know if it's the first part is missing. Or it's the look, let's assume. Well, let's let's look at that expression we had here. We had, okay, let's remove the plus one. Two parentheses, six by two hundred parentheses, close minus. I parse. I'm the parser. Okay, I see a parenthesis. Then I see an expression, which in my case is, I don't know, yes, something like that. And afterwards, I see the closing parenthesis, so I know that's done. Okay, I saw two of them. Yeah, I saw the first one go into the expression, see the second one, resolves the expression inside the parenthesis, sees the closing expression, everything is fine. Then I see my, my minus, and then this thing, I get a closing bracket and not, par not a parenthesis. So I know the first expression has been passed properly, but after that I, I got some error. You see that? Oh. Uh, you have to ask, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> but they solved that, obviously, so at least he claims to, to have solved that. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm running out of time here, but it's, it's really exciting stuff, I think, and, and uh, I, I'll try to rush through it. The third example I wanted to show you is when you use the same grammar, we, we saw to use a grammar to match, we saw, the, we saw how to use a grammar to calculate, we saw how to use a grammar to build a compiler, and this time I wanted to show you how to use the same grammar to build an internal representation of my expression, just an AST. Um, and I assume uh, simplified that my AST is nothing else than a variant of either a int, a binary operation, or a unary operation, right? That's all I can see. When, when I pass mathematic expression, I either get a binary operation, A plus B, a unary operation, unary minus, or I, I get a plain integer. So that's suddenly simplified. You actually have to use recursive variant and, and stuff like that, but just to, to understand the, the, the concept, let's assume that this thing can be recursive, right? The binary operation is a struct which contains the operation I found and the left expression and the right expression of that operation. The unary is another struct which contains operation plus or minus and the expression which is this operation is, is prepended to. Make sense? So now we, we are going to use the same grammar to build a recursive data structure which contains the representation of our data. Okay, we don't want to get an int, we want to get an AST node out of that grammar. That's the only change we need here. And essentially nothing changed, right? 
The trick is that we added overloaded operators to our AST node. Operator star equals, operator slash equals, operator plus equals, and so on. And that's the only thing we did to the AST data structure, which contains the variant and the overloaded operators mapping to those operations. And that's it. And I compile it, and afterwards I get a recursive data structure containing the representation of my input string in memory. Make sense? No? Huh? Sorry? Ah, that's again these lazy phoenix functions which do something to the node that just convert the, the sign of the, of the integer there. And finally, that's the lines you have to invoke it. That's the invocation, that's the Hogwarts thing you have to do. You have your calculator, that's a grammar we defined. You define a single instance of your AST node you want to get. You say, oh, that's my input. And then you call pass with the two iterators to that input. You specify the grammar and you specify your attribute you want to get filled in. And that's it. And if everything goes well, you get that attribute filled. The AST contains your binary tree. And you can write a function which prints out whatever your tree has. And if you do that, what do we get? We get 2 times 3. OK, that's just the internal representation printed here for you so you see it. It has an operation star with two operands, 2 and 3. And this more complex operation gets a more complex internal representation. That's key for you. Karma. Karma is a young to key scene. Everything you know about key and what I told you about key is still true, but you just have to stand on your head. Or apply it inside out or uh, upside down or so. Key is all about data input matching and conversion. Karma is all about output conversion and formatting. Key gets input from input iterators. Karma delivers data to output iterators. Key uses left shift, Karma uses right shift. Or the other way around, right and left. I never get that. Um, key semantic actions are called after the match and receive a value. Karma's semantic actions are called before the formatting and uh, provide the value. Key's parser attributes are passed down, karma's passed up, and karma's are passed down because they are consumed. Just a couple of examples to show you how karma works. So, in the simplest case, a 10, a literal, and a C, you get that output. You can have an int and a literal, and you provide the attributes for those guys, not immediately, but using semantic actions, works. You have a vector of 1 to 3, and you provide that vector to a clean. You get 1 to 3, and the list operator. Just very simple examples. I think that's quick and understandable. As I said in the beginning, karma can be used to separate data and format. And this table just gives you different ways to format a standard vector of integers. If I want to write them in brackets, I get that. If I want to write them comma separated, I get that. And so on and so on and so on. If you want to have a right aligned com column with a standard size separated by, by new lines, you can do that and things like that. Or a HTML bullet list or so. So the same data type can be used for different output formatting. You see, works. But the other way around, what about using the same format description for different data types? Works as well. A stream is a magic thing which internally invokes did stream output formatting. And when I pass an array, I can generate C style arrays, vectors, lists, boosted array range. In the end, everything which can give you a pair of iterators, right? Works as well. I'm really rushing through that because I'm, I'm already out of time. Uh, semantic actions are really similar, except of 
return the round assignment because I want to provide a value to that thing. And that's the interesting thing. I'm using the same data structure I generated from the parser and I want to print something out of it. In this case, I need an AST node, a unary operation, and a binary operation. So it's a bit more involved. And that answers your question, or goes in the direction of your question, why can't I use the same format? And you see that in this case, I'm concerned about the internal data representation. I want to output that somehow, and not about the external representation, which descri is described by the format. Just ignore these things for now. <coughs> then we, I'll get back to that. So an AST is an integer or a binary node or a U node. We already saw that in the very beginning. And a binary node is an AST followed by a character, the operation and the AST. And the unary is the character followed by the AST. And what we are doing here, uh, if you remember, sequences take fusion sequences as their attribute. And, but Unfortunately, our binary operation, or <coughs> our, our, our structure we had here, this AST node, is everything else but a fusion sequence, right? In the key case, we worked around that by defining that overloaded operators. But in this case, we can't do that. So what we do, we use these magic incantations and say, hey, that's a structure. But actually, I want to interpret that, or I want you to interpret that as a fusion sequence. So there's a fusion macro, this structure. I want to interpret it as a structure or a fusion sequence of an AST node left, a character op, and an AST node right. Um, if you look at the corresponding code again, that's a binary op, car op, AST node left. ST not right. So it's exactly the structure I, I defined there and that makes a fusion sequence out of that. I'm doing the same thing for here and once I did that I can use the binary op and the unary op as fusion sequences in my output operation. And what you can see 2 by 3 I get the AST 2 by 3 for this expression this one. And now I'm doing a s very simple trick. What I'm doing, I switch the, by, and the this and this. I switch those and I switch those. It's a bit hard to see here. So perhaps you saw that. So the operation is not in between the AST anymore. That means that my fusion sequence is not AST node character AST node anymore, but AST node AST node character. And I rewrite my grammar. And the difference here is I now get a reverse Polish notation out of my same input data structure. For 2 by 3, I get the RPN 2, 3 star. And for my more complex expression. I get this more complex reverse Polish notation. So, <coughs> same input data structure, a bit tweaking of formatting and changing the output format and I get a completely different output representation. What? In your format description they are the parentheses, the parentheses, I left them in just to avoid ambiguities in the generated expression because other no ah, I'm sorry, yeah, that's you're right. These just think of those. Yeah, uh, you're right. I'm I'm sorry for that, yeah. I mean here you need them for the unary stuff just to distinguish whether it's a unary operation. But here you don't need them. You're right. These parentheses have to go. Okay, I'm done. Fifteen minutes over time. Uh, Joel. Uh, uh, so Joel told me that I should present those two slides. Well, let's yeah. see if I can do that. Um, the second part of this uh, spirit session is about scheme. Or let me put the other way around, is about a rapid development framework for key parsers. And uh, let me give you a short overview of what you will see today and then we will just um, drill a bit deeper for each of the parts. We will start with a 
very nice data structure which we called an U tree, which is essentially a discriminated union. Um, we need as or we use as the underlying representation of everything we are doing there. Uh, Joel will uh, talk about that U tree in more detail so you understand why that's needed. What we then will do, we will define a key parser which parses arbitrary S expressions, sets those funny parent thesis. <laughs> I'm still trying. Somebody told me how to pronounce Par parentheses. Parentheses. Um, and with, with many parentheses, and what you see here is just a scheme definition of a function taking one, param uh, one parameter and returning that same parameter as a result value. And what we will do, we write a parser which interprets that string and creates a u-tree out of that. Then, just for the heck of it, we, we do the same, and we suddenly will use karma for, for that parser. That's the whole, whole idea of that session. And then we will use the same U tree and generate the same string expression out of it using karma. What the next step, what we will do is we will create a scheme compiler which uses the U tree, the data stored in the U tree, to interpret that as a scheme. In, in, in terms of the scheme language and um, essentially executes that code you, you give it. Mm. Now it gets interesting. Um, what if, if we have a key expression like this one, int followed by a comma, followed by an int, and we convert that to an equivalent U tree? So I just show you the U tree or the scheme expression which corresponds sorry no scheme expression s expression okay. is the same so the the s expression which corresponds to that key parser and that's what we will generate out of it and we will create the corresponding U tree representation of that s expression which corresponds to the key parser mm. you see that yeah so in this case it's just a key sequence with three arguments the first is a key int, the second is a key lit with one, uh, with one argument, which is comma, and a key int. Um, well, then for the heck of it, again, let's do the same thing in reverse order and use the same U tree we, we created from the, from the uh, key parser and generate the key parser out of it again. And suddenly we will use karma for that. <coughs> and the only thing which is missing is Let's write a key compiler which interprets that U tree which we got from that key expression as a key expression and allows you to parse or interpret that U tree and parse input so that you have a dynamic version of spirit in the end of, of key. You give it a key expression, you give it some arbitrary input. It will generate the U tree, and the key compiler will generate the code which interprets the initial key expression and parses your input. And everything is dynamic, it's at runtime, and you can have a very quick turnaround. And if you additionally think about, about additional layers around that, for instance, let's parse or create some U tree representation of a parser which has a left recursion in it. We learned that left recursion, left recursion is something uh, recursive descent parsers don't handle very well. But there are formal ways of transforming that into right recursive grammars. And if we write some scheme code which actually transform our U tree into a different U tree which is right recursive instead of the left recursive thing and convert that back to the key representation, we get what we wanted, right? We get a framework which understands key, gives you the means to transform whatever internal representation of that key parser you got and to generate key from it and just add a nice GUI to it and you have a rapid development platform, right? <coughs> we won't get to the step of GUI, we won't get to the step of transforming the U tree into something else. The time doesn't permit that and we didn't have enough time and preparation to, to get to that. But essentially you get the whole framework we can use to build the everything. Um, so 
that's what we want to talk about in in the next 45 minutes okay. and now Joao has to take over okay so it's my turn now um, I'm thanking Hartmut because um, I'm still jet lagged and um, acclimating so <laughs> Hartmut took most of the talk from me thank you Hartmut next time let's not just not do our presentation on a Monday. <laughs> it's really tough. Anyway, so um, I'm starting with Scheme. So what is Scheme? Um, it's a small but powerful language. It, it's general purpose. Uh, it's, it's, you can use it for uh, a scripting language and for ex extension language. Uh, it's derived from Lisp, one of the oldest languages um, apart from Fortran. I, I think it's second from fortune right so uh, it works with abstract lists so uh, data and functions are just lists so everything is a list so uh, that's why it's lisp and uh, with uh, scheme what's different is that it's uh, basically um, a better version of scheme um, lisp uh, it's lexi lexically scoped instead of um, dyna uh, dynamically scoped. Uh, it borrows some of the uh, ideas from Algol and um, Algol's uh, line of languages like Pascal, Modula 2. So uh, with Scheme and with Lisp, everything is an expression. Uh, like some of the new scripting languages today, Scheme is dynamically typed as opposed to stat statically typed in like C and C++. I'm sure I don't have to expand on these things, right? So um, these are really very intelligent group of people. So I'm sure you already know these things. So just a quick background. So uh, Scheme is mostly a functional language. Mostly, not like Haskell, which is a more pure form of a functional language. Um, because in Scheme, you can still do imperative stuff, and you still have um, mutable data structures. So you have assignment, and you have mutation. And like with um, more recent functional programming languages like Haskell, where mutation is not allowed, it's pure. Okay, uh, with Scheme though, um, and with Lisp, uh, we have first class functions, unlike with C and um, all, all those languages. So basically, you can have function vari as, uh, variables, you can pass function as arguments, you can return functions from functions. So these are what you call the higher order functions. Okay, uh, unlike some of the newer functional languages, Scheme is eagerly evaluated. So what that means is that when you enter a function, all the arguments are evaluated. But there are some special cases though. For example, with if, with and, or with or, like in C, or with uh, C++, it's lazily evaluated. So if you have if, condition, and um, true, then false, uh, false, uh, true branch, false branch. Uh, if the condition is true, the false branch will not be evaluated. So there's something of a mix there. And there's, in fact, a version of scheme, which is called lazy scheme, where everything is lazy, like in Haskell. So, uh, yeah, with Scheme, you can have functions that return functions. So that's your way to have lazy evaluation, just return a function. Some people call that a promise. So you don't evaluate actually, but you return another function, and that functions, uh, when evaluated, um, calls the promised function, something like that. Okay, so with scheme and with list, everything is a prefix expression. Uh, tons of 
parentheses. So here's an expression, sample expression. Here's how you have it in Scheme, and here's how you have it in C, C++. Again, a more complex expression and your C, C++ counterpart. Okay, um, with Scheme, you can have symbols, identifiers like that, like the plus. So plus is just another uh, symbol. So um, this is just a function. Everything is just a function. There's no notion of operators and things like that. Everything is a function. So here's your counterpart in C. More complex, getting more complex. But you see that the important thing is here is that uh, you have a consistent syntax here, unlike with C, C++, where you have infix and when you have a function call, it, this uh, syntax is different. With scheme, everything is the same. You have the, the, you have the function name and then the arguments all sur uh, surrounded by a parenthesis. So everything is consistent. That's an, one of the nice things with scheme. So here's how you do if. So again, this is a function call, and this is the condition, the true branch and the false branch. And with the condition, is again another function call, comparing A and B. And uh, this is your C++ counterpart. Okay, so uh, here now is how you define functions in scheme. So um, comparing that to that, this is um, simpler, more terse. Okay, so as expressions, uh, oh, okay. So partial indication scheme, so just giving a function that expects two parameters, just one, and you get back a function. Yeah. Still expecting. Yes. Okay. You can do that. It's um, like partial application, yeah. Currying, yeah. Okay. So S expressions, uh, some call it scheme expressions, but actually S expressions predate scheme. It's actually called symbolic expressions. So uh, that's from the original uh, inventor of scheme, uh, sorry, Lisp. So um, the language of Lisp scheme programs for parenthesized expressions. So again, very simple grammar. I think we have just a couple of rules when we implemented this uh, S expression parser. No more than six, I guess. We will see that. Yeah, we'll see that later on. Um, a Hartmut will be talking about the S expression parser. So uh, it's recursive, list based. So it's a, it's a, uh, basically it represents a data structure. So uh, S expressions is more than scheme, it's more than Lisp. You can represent any type of hierarchical information. In fact, you can use it as a replacement for XML. And it's very terse, it's very compact. More comp compact than XML, of course, and even terser than JSON. So uh, here are some of the uses of X expressions outside scheme and Lisp. So uh, is, is DSSL, if I'm not mistaken, uh, that's the original implementation for, I have the notes here, but I, I can see the notes, uh, for, 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 for um, style sheets, CSS, CSS for, uh, um, uh, what was that, um, the precursor of uh, XML which is SGML. SGML, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm having a mental block because of this. Uh, anyway, okay, so here are just some of the examples of using X S expressions. Okay, so I'll be discussing U3, and then after that, I'll be passing 
it again to Hartmut and he will be discussing um, the S expression parser and generator. And then I'll be coming back again uh, to uh, present the scheme compiler and the key compiler. So, <clears throat> what's a U tree? It's a discriminated union, as uh, Hartmut um, mentioned a while ago. Uh, it's similar to what you have in scripting languages, dynamic languages like Python and uh, Scheme, of course, uses that. So you have basically a dynamic data structure, which can be one of this. So it can be nil, which is an empty list. It can be a Boolean, it's example, is it true or false, an, an integer, a double, it can be a string. Uh, we implemented some uh, very nice features with the U trees such that uh, to make it very compact and efficient. So we have uh, the, the U tree is just 16 bytes. And um, in, in cases where uh, the string can fit in that 16 bytes, uh, we place it uh, there in situ. So um, optimization there. So you have a special kind of a string, which is a symbol. So uh, uh, function names are symbols, identifiers, basically. Uh, for uh, for representing binary, we also added that. We won't be using that though, but um, it's there if uh, you want to use as expressions as is to uh, parse your data. So uh, here you have a list. It's a heterogeneous type list. It can be uh, uh, any of this. The elements can be any of that. The discriminated union. So in this case, it's just a symbol, an integer, and a string. So these are just for internal purposes, so uh, to make it more efficient uh, when representing data internally. Same for internal purposes. Uh, we won't be using this, but uh, it's sometimes nice to have some opaque data there um, represented as a void pointer and plus the type info. So the type is checked dynamically at runtime. And last but not least, a U tree can be a function. So if, with this function signature, so it returns a U tree and it takes in a scope. So what is a scope? Um, basically just a con container of arguments, but there's more to it than that. So here are some U3 examples. Uh, we are in C++ land, so um, here's uh, constructing uh, the default constructed U3, that's a uh, nil U3. Here, that's a Boolean U3. An integer, a car. But um, I should mention, though, that there's no uh, car there uh, in the discriminated union that um, I presented um, a while ago. You don't have a car. So that's converted to a string. A double and a string. What would you do with a white string? Oh, um, this is inter I, I'm glad you asked that because internally all strings are represented as UTF-8. So there you go, it's uh, Unicode. So here are more examples. Um, I'm creating a list now. So I start with an, a default constructed list which is a nil empty, empty list. Then I push back one to three, and I push back uh, a string. I create another list, val two, 
I push back double, I push back another string. Then I push back this string into that. So um, that's kind of powerful uh, with using, uh, with uh, u trees you can do that. You can have, uh, because it's heterogeneous, so you can represent any kind of um, data structure. Uh, if you look closely, this is, uh, becomes uh, something like a tree. So this uh, small figure uh, uh, shows what's happening there. So you have the first, U3 list there, and the third element is another list. So you can have complex data structures with U trees. So uh, more examples: um, comparison returns a bool. Comparison again, and um, uh, arithmetic operations. You can do that as well. Uh, in this case. Uh, the first value is in integer, and the second is uh, double. So uh, internally, it does double dispatch. So uh, the type here will be a double. So basically, the type is promoted. OK, so you can have references there also. So uh, you have a value here, which is an integer, and then I created another U tree which references val using bootstrap. Yeah. And what happens if the types for my operators don't make sense like if I try to add a string to <coughs> Well, um, it's checked dynamically, checked at runtime, so you'll have an, uh, a throw there, so exception. Okay? So here's another. Um, way to alias. So you can also have ranges. And uh, here you basically tell the U tree that you don't want a deep copy. So we just get the iterators to begin and end and store that without storing all the data from the source. Okay, there you go. So that's the U tree part. Um, I'll pass it back again to Hartmut for the S expression parser. Okay. It's kind of fiddly here. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, S expression parser. Just let's assume we have <coughs> these parentheses. I got it right this time. Um, and uh, we, we have an expression, a very complex expression, and we want to convert that to a U-tree. How would we do that? Um, certainly, we want to do that with key. So the first thing we say, OK, we define a grammar in key which just returns a U-tree as its attribute. The same thing as we saw already on, on the previous slides. And we will see what, what we have to put here into the, into the grammar definition. <coughs> as input, we get arbitrary complex expressions as expressions, which might contain some uni Unicode code, uh, Unicode strings. Please don't ask me what that means. That's something in Greek. And uh, which can be arbitrary complex. <coughs> and you can have a symbol, doubles, and booleans, whatever can be stored in a U-tree. It's fully Unicode capable, and it stores all the Unicode symbols internally as a UTF-8 byte sequence. Sorry. Let's think about how this, how to get to a grammar which describes our U-tree or our S expression. Well, in the simplest case, we have a couple of elements there. And each of those elements can be either, either an atomic element, a non-list, or it could be a list of elements. And I, in red, I just put the attribute of the corresponding expression there, uh, just to, to get the attribute propagation through the parser, right? So we always have some reference. OK, a list is, as we expect, as a parenthesis, followed by 
0 to n elements followed by the closing parenthesis. And as you can see, we use these expectation operators here just to allow error handling later on because when we know that we have a parenthesis, we have to get at least zero elements or a closing parenthesis here. Otherwise, we have an, a syntax error in the input string. Uh, the overall expression is, as we might expect again, or the overall attribute is in U-tree. <coughs> a atomic element is either a double or integer or a string or a byte string or a symbol or a bool. Again, it's essentially what we what Joel has been talking about, right? It's it's essentially what we want to represent there. Um, let's go further. An integer. Well, in the simplest case, it's an integer, so the elementary integer puzzle. But we said, okay, let's allow hex and octal numbers there as well. And so, grammar for a octal um, integer is a zero followed by oct. Oct is a predefined parser in, in key. And this lexeme like like uh, directive says that we don't want to do skipping in between. So if there is some white space in between the zero and the oct, then it actually doesn't match an octal number. And the same thing for the hexadecimal representation. It's just a no case OX, so I, I want to be able to accept capital X there as well, followed by um, a hex parser, which is again a primitive parser and predefined parser in, in key. So we don't have to worry about the actual conversion from hexadecimal string representation into the internal representation. In this case, we want to get back an int, right? I mean, we could have returned a U tree as well, but just it's simpler this way. A binary data, that's what we call byte string here, is one to n pairs of hex digit, digits enclosed in these hash signs. Again, we use like seam because we don't want to have spaces or other comments or stuff like that in between. So it's a hash sign which has to be followed by at least two hex numbers and which has to be followed by another hash sign just to, to be matched properly. We get back a binary string which is one of the internal represent or internal data types which can be stored in uString. And last but not least, we want to recognize symbols. And a symbol is a character, character sequence uh, which cannot contain a couple of characters. So it can't contain white space, it can't contain parentheses, semicolon, and so on and so on. Um, and the way to write that in spirit key is that we say, okay, we have a car underscore and we give it the list of not allowed characters, but we want to get the opposite of that, so we just negate that character class. So this thing will, will match everything but any of those characters. And then we want to have at least one of those. That's a plus. And suddenly we want to have it like seam because we don't want to have any white space in between the symbols, right? Did it have to be put into a std string first? Uh, excuse me? Did it have to be put into a std string first? <coughs> Did exclude have to be a std string or couldn't the literal be right in the char? Uh, it's a std string because we add a, a zero byte here. Oh, I can't see it. That's, <laughs> the, that's the only reason, just to make it, to make it work. Below and behind head, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry. So you could could have put it directly in there. Would have worked as well. A symbol can have dash and scheme, right? Hmm? A symbol can have dash and scheme, right? Oh yeah. So how does that get how you, how do you just That's a range, it's not a dash. Okay. That's a range from uh, O X O one to one F is a, is all, all of them are, are prohibited. So and that gives you a sense of the power you have in the predefined character parsers in, in, in key. So th that's a primitive parser, right? Which is able to match anything what's given here and it interprets that dash properly because I want to have a range there and, and things like that. And we just take the inverse. So it will match everything but that. <coughs> so far so easy, right? And it's fa fairly straightforward. And if you, that's actually code 
You know, there is not a single semantic action, as you can see. And let's talk about that, why there isn't any semantic action. Um, this thing, when executed, will parse your input and will produce a U tree, even if you don't have a semantic action there. And the reason is these attribute propagation rules I was mentioning in the beginning. So let's assume we, we are parsing a list. So the attribute of the list is a U tree. That U tree is passed to that whole expression. These guys don't contribute, they just get dropped. And this thing expects to get a container. Okay, Joel was clever, and he just defines a proper interface on the U tree, which Spirits expects for containers, the pushback function. So this thing, when executed, for each element it matches, it just pushes it back to the U tree, which gets U tree instance, which it gets passed from the left hand side. So essentially, this expression fills in the U tree, which it, it gets passed from the outside, and that happens on all of those parsers. And um, which gives you a sense of the power you get from these attribute propagations. Just implicit knowledge how, to, how the parsers actually do and what they do with attributes. And once you get that idea that attributes are just passed from the left hand side to the right hand side, and the right hand side takes, the, and they are passed by reference, by the way. So, and, and you the right hand side just takes a reference to the actual attribute and puts its stuff in it matches. And that's one of the reasons why Spirit is so fast, because no non-needed copies of data are, are made at any point. You just provide an instance of your U tree on the very top, this thing gets passed down by reference, and whenever somebody has to contrib contribute something, it just pushes it into that U tree instance, which has been provided on the, on the top. So you don't make any copies anywhere. You just fill in the, the actual attribute. So far okay? Okay, let's talk about the string parser, which is a bit more tricky because, uh, as we mentioned, it's Unicode, and in Unicode, when you want to represent Unicode as UTF-8, each code point can be represented as several characters and an arbitrary number of, or from one to six bytes. So you can't just have a character as an attribute for a single character in the input, but you have to have some, something string-like. And the things sh we, we wanted to match uh, these extended Unicode notation, which comes from C++, you know that, so a dash U with four digits or a dash capital U with eight <coughs> digits. It should still understand the normal escape sequences, and it should convert any UTF-16 or UTF-32 code uh, input into the internal UTF-8 byte representation. Um, so we are using the string as an attribute of that string parser. Uh, because we just store these UTF-8 bytes and for convenience. Let's look at that grammar, which is a separate grammar, by the way, and if you look at the code, you will see that, that we separated it out because it's useful not only in the context of the S expression grammar, but can be used in the key grammar as well. So let's think about what is a character literal. A character literal is a single escape character which is not a, a what's that? Cool. Apostrophe, colon, no, it's an apostrophe, right? Mm -hmm. And which is enclosed in apostrophes. So what we get is an apostrophe followed by a escaped character. We will see how that expands. Or anything which is not an apostrophe followed by the, the closing one. And here is one of the very uh, few semantic actions you see. Val is a std string. Underscore one refers to a character, so it has, is refers to a character. And this one just invokes a normal operator plus equals of std string and pushes whatever it matched here into the attribute of the whole thing. So the result of that character literal if it matches the, the second half, will be just the character which has been escaped. Uh, yeah, just the character inside the apostrophe. This thing we will see a bit later. I, I'll get back to that. And that's, by the way, you ask about why are we using the functional 
Decla function declaration syntax. That's a inherited attribute. You see that the left-hand side, which gets passed to that parser and passed down, and that parser actually uses it to, to push its, its data in. We will see it in a second. Um, the second thing, a string, a string literal is very similar. It's just the quotes. Uh, and inside the quotes, I have 0 to n escape characters or something which is not a quote. And again, the same, same thing as, as for the character literal. And now we get to that interesting thing, you see? So this parser, which is the character escape, has no attribute itself, but it takes a reference to the thing it gets passed in. That's why reference, and that's the function notation syntax this rule has as its attribute. And if you see, okay, this one passes val, which refers to the attribute of the left-hand side to that parser. So that parser gets the val passed in. And here we have underscore r1, which refer references the first argument it has been invoked with. So it's essentially this wall, which, which comes from the attribute. And if you look closer, what we're actually doing here is an escape character is a backslash followed by either a non-capital U with four hex digits, a capital U with eight hex digits, or a backslash with any of those. So normal C escaped sequences. And these guys, we will see them in a second, are again lazy functions, which take the destination they got from the invocation and the value they got from, from their parser they are attached to. Make sense? That's one of those lazy functions defined in Phoenix. <coughs> so let's start in the, in, the, in the bottom. We define push UTF-8. That's the one we used here, right? We used it here. That's exactly that symbol. That push UTF-8 is a Phoenix function generated from this implementation. And this implementation is just a struct which exposes an operator, which then gets the two arguments I saw on the previous slide. Well, you see, push UTF-8 will be called from, with two arguments. So we have to define a operator, function operator, which takes two arguments. So these two things which in the semantic action get passed in end up here in, the, in this function. And what this function is doing, it gets one code point, which is Unicode, and the string where the UTF-8 string has to be stored and uses the uh, boost UTF-8 output iterator, which is defined in the regex library to convert the UTF-32 bit, uh, 32 code point into the corresponding UTF-8 character sequence. That's it. Mm, very similar for the other one, for the push escape uh, lazy function. Straightforward, you get that code point, which is one of those characters, and I push back the proper escape character into the UTF-8. Okay. Uh, uh, so just quickly, would, should, would there actually be another, um, if I understood correctly, another function call operator on both of, on the uh, push? See, the here, for, here. For the, for that's the, the other one. Big, no, for the, for the second, for the big U hex 8, yeah. does that need... I mean that oh, thing. No, okay. no, that no, thing. That that both of those can use the. the right, 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 right. They okay. just use the UTF-33, uh, uh, 32, and and okay. this one uses the single character which is matched after the escape, uh, the backslash. Okay, uh, you see those squiggly characters here. When I run it and pass it the string I showed you in the beginning with that Greek in it then you will get the UTF-8 UTF representation of that initial Unicode string we, we saw there, and that's why you don't see these nice um, Greek le uh, letters here. That's just intentional, so you see that internally really UTF-8 is stored. And that's just what, what the console prints out when, when it gets these quickly uh, Unicode 8, uh, UTF-8 um, characters. Make sense? Time to open the door again. <laughs> 
was time to change that. Okay, no, Jen, just do it. I'll, I'll just shut up for a second. <laughs> Two minutes, okay, then. Um, there, were, there have been several uh, questions about how we handle errors in, <coughs> in parsing, and I want to show you how we handle the errors here in, in, in the S expression parser. What we do there, we actually use not a straight iterator, which we get from the input, what we generate a position iterator. We've been talking about that. So it's an iterator which keeps track, in addition to reference the input, it keeps track of the actual position inside the, the uh, input. So whenever plus plus on that iterator is called, it not only moves forward the underlying iterator, but it increments the column number and the line number appropriately, whatever it, it founds. So the iterator stores not only the data, it stores the, act, the current position of that data item in the input string. Um, that's one. The second thing is um, we have these uh, expect operators everywhere. I showed you that. And what we do here on this slide is we define the error handler we, we want to invoke whenever an error occurs. Uh, this error handler has, is expected to expose a function, or it, it has to be a function uh, taking four arguments. In this case, we define a function object which is doing that, and the four arguments are the following. The first one is an iterator pointing to the beginning of the current token I'm passing.